Yeah. All right. Great. Um, and just a cute. Uh, no, no, I can't change the PowerPoint. Um, just a few um, announcements. If you haven't seen, we have our wonderful conference coming up in May in lovely San Antonio. Please mark those dates on the calendar. We would love to see you there. Um, registration will go live in January. So, but it's never too soon to block those dates on your calendar. And I know many of you also submitted workshop proposals and staff and peer reviewers are, are working through all that. And so I look forward to sharing with all of you what our conference will look like very soon. And I hope that you can make it. For those of you who are executive directors at your agency or from any rape crisis or family violence agency, we also have our executive director conference coming up in February, February 12th and 13th. And as you know, this is a legislative session here, and we are having Capital Day um, on February 14th with our sister coalition, the Texas Council on Family Violence. So if you don't have that on your calendar yet, um, feel free to mark those dates. Registration for the Executive Director Conference is open on the Texas Council on Family Violence's website. They host the registration. So if you are ready to register for the Executive Director Conference, please just check out their website and their event listing. And I think that finishes my announcement. So I have the pleasure of introducing you to Ms. Holly Cochran. She is actually here in my neck of the woods. I'm part of the remote staff in Dallas, and Holly is a victim advocate at the Frisco Police Department. But more importantly today, she is the president-elect of the TASA board, and she has put this wonderful presentation together along with her fellow board members to share with you what board service looks like for us at TASA. I'm just gonna change screens to Holly, and she's gonna take it away. Thank you so, so much, Christina. So as Christina switches over, just wanted to thank you all so much for being on the call today um, and putting up with our cheesy puns because uh, that's a, a big part of who I am. Um, and one of our goals as a board this year has really been to ensure that membership just knows that your voice is heard. I mean, that's, that's a huge part of being a board member. And one of the things you have said is you want more information and ability to access it. So as we begin the board nomination process for 2019, we wanted to start with helping bring some awareness on what it means to serve on the TASA board requirements and give everyone just a chance to get to know us. Later on in the call, I'll um, introduce some of our board members as well. And they'll be monitoring the chat box like Christina mentioned to help answer questions throughout so um, again, thank y'all for being here. So we'll go ahead and just get started. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Is that showing? It looks good. Thanks, Christina. I'm, it's, webinars are, are newer to me to function remotely, so bear with me, but please feel free, like Christina said, to chat in the box, stop if you have any questions, and um, you know, let me know, if, or let us know if you have any technical difficulties. So. Let's get started. So I bet you're wondering why we gathered you all here today. So our goals, just so you know what to expect, is to provide an overview just on how TASA board functions. And we'll give a very general overview, but we'll also let you know where you can find more information on just the ins and outs of the board. After that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Christina. Since she is a nonprofit leadership specialist, she works a lot with boards and she used to actually serve on the TASA board at one point in time. So I wanted to give her a chance to talk a little bit more about some universal truths of board and board service and um, kind of how that relates to TASA's board. And then after that, we'll just dig deeper into introducing the current board members so you can see what types of positions are on our board as a whole, as well as identify the positions that are gonna be open for our upcoming board elections. And we'll um, end with talking about eligibility criteria and giving some open time for question and answer so that way everyone can really make sure that they feel fully informed um, to the best of our ability here today on the call. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. 
So quick poll, how many of you have served or are currently serving on a board right now? And you can just type that into the chat box. David Scott, awesome. Nicole, yes, our board president. Board president. And yes. Olivia, who is one of yes. our region reps. I hope all the TASA board members say yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Heather's a newbie, awesome. Feel free to include too what board you're serving on if you would like. And Selma is on our board as well as Regency Rep. Oh, we've got someone from the TCFB board. Respond, awesome. Okay. Got it. Oh, that's true, Heather. Many, I know many of you on the on the webinar today are um, executive directors, so you, you work with boards all the time. Very true, very true. Yeah, parent-teacher boards count, absolutely. And girls Boys Club. and Girls Club, awesome. Great, well, it seems like we've got um, kind of a wide array of people who either are on boards or are working with boards, so that's great. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that tends to happen is when we have different boards that we serve on. I know myself, I've served on different boards as well. And even though there's some kind of commonalities between boards, there are also some differences. And so I just wanted to give an overview on um, what that looks like. Um, and one of the biggest things I think that sets us apart with TASA being a membership agency is in order to be a part of the board or, or run for the board, you have to be a member. Um, and that's part of the impact you can have as being a member of TASA. So as a um, board member, one of the things that we're able to do is help influence legislative agenda. But again, that is also based on the overall voices of membership as well. Um, provide oversight for the agency. We're able to um, share local trends and feedback from other members. So if you attend your region meetings, and you're talking about things that you're seeing or experiencing with um, maybe survivors you're working with or maybe the systems you're working in and we see those trends you know part of our job in order to impact the movement as a whole is to bring those things back to our board meetings and and share that um, information to help inform TASA's work um, and and that plays into supporting the overall movement so TASA which is an amazing organization obviously if you're on the call you already know that but the movement is bigger than TASA you know we're trying to support um, the movement as a whole ending sexual violence as a whole and all of the things that allow that to continue and Having a voice in that and seeing the movement change and being able to inspire and influence change is a big part of being a board member and as well as just being a member of TASA. So while some member, um, some agencies that you may be able to join a board on, you don't have to be a member. Um, they may not even be a membership agency. You may not have even had to volunteer for the agency. But at TASA, we really pride ourselves in wanting to allow membership's voice to be heard. So that's one of the biggest impact areas um, that we have. And then our governing style. So we're really, really focused on the outward vision. We always like to say we focus on the ends and not the means of getting there. So we don't control any internal processes or, you know, we don't tell, you know, Tasa, hey, you need to um, start this new program or maybe um, provide these trainings differently. You know, we stay out of kind of the um, the day-to-day -day things so we can focus on that bigger picture of ending sexual violence and focusing on TASA's overall mission. Um, and that's where our expertise with our board members come in. Uh, we'll talk later how we're recruiting for different um, types of people to run for at-large positions and we do that because we know having different areas of expertise as a board creates an overall stronger board body. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to lean on one person's um, expertise or judgment or value over what TASA stands for and what the overall goal of the board is. So um, even though we may recruit for specific positions, if that makes sense, or specific um, disciplines, 
we're doing that to strengthen our board and help it really reflect membership, but not necessarily so we can have, you know, just one voice be heard. And then proactivity and strategic leadership is a big part of what we do rather than reactivity and again, getting in that administrative detail. Well, absolutely, you know, you may see when um, things happen um, in the media that impact the movement as a board, we're, we are as part of our overall strategic leadership gonna maybe comment on things or help get the, um, uh, the messages that TASA sends out, um, we're gonna help spread those overall messages, but TASA overall and TASA staff decides what that message is gonna be. And we may give our, our input and, and share the information that we hear from membership to help draft or create what those talking points or what that message might be, but we're not necessarily telling anyone how to do their, their job. Um, and there's, you know, kind of a, a caveat to that that I'm sure Christina is going to address here in a second when she just talks about what the role of um, the overall board is. So, you know, hopefully that kind of helps provide a general overview. We're definitely going to talk a little bit more about it here um, in a minute. But I guess the biggest thing we just want you to know is that every nonprofit obviously has a board. You know, it, it can really help an agency thrive, but it can also hold an agency back if board members are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So, um, you know, I think that's why it's really important to understand what our roles are and what we really aim to do before you actually run uh, for a board position as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Christina so she can talk about some of those universal truths of the board. Okay, great. Thanks, Holly. You want to go ahead? There we are. Mm -hmm. um, so universal truth. So you heard Holly mention earlier, if you've seen one board, you've seen one board, right? You know, there's, we've all probably, if you're working with a board, if you're working under a board, you've been on a board, I imagine you have sat through that uh, orientation session or something about basic board roles and responsibilities, right? And you know, if you've served on a board and multiple boards, how people fulfill those roles and responsibilities can, can look different based off the type of organization, the life cycle of the nonprofit, if it's a new nonprofit or a nonprofit that's well established. Um, even the mission and vision can change that dynamic, right? But there are some universal truths about what our responsibility is and our due diligence as board members and um, how we do it in, in terms of our governing style may look different. Um, but, you know, big picture wise, we have some big buckets really about um, the functions of boards. So these are really three big ones, right? Setting the organizational direction, right? Uh, talking about that big picture thinking. What is the mission and vision and purpose? And boards have to monitor that because organizations change and shift and we have to be conscious of um, mission drift right um, we also live in a culture and a community that you know may be rapidly changing and that and that changes over time and so constantly boards are charged with this big picture thinking about discerning and determining that philosophical foundation of what the organization does and its impact you know where are we who are we where are we and how do we get there right and I know the TASA board very specifically, um, you know, follows a very structured um, governance style, um, partly because we are a membership organization. So the makeup of board members may look a little bit different than other nonprofits. Um, but we also want to be very strategic about how we're really working to end um, sexual assault. So it's a lot of big picture thinking on the TASA board. And then, of course, um, boards serve. Um, as an oversight, you know, um, nonprofits are legally bound to have boards, right? Um, and as part of that oversight, we want to make sure that we are um, ensuring some legal and ethical standards, right? That we are um, providing oversight, not necessarily, like Holly said, the day-to-day -day of the organization or the day-to-day -day of every um, operational step, but more about the overall picture of the programs and their impact, right? Um, 
you know, board has has a place to, to look at that. Are we doing what we said we would do? Are we fulfilling our mission, right? That big, big picture. And then ensuring necessary resources. And this is probably the one that everyone focuses on the most, right? Because that's where we get into that fiduciary responsibility and that lovely fundraising question, right? But really when we're talking about ensuring necessary resources, you know, we're, we're not just talking about funding, which that is a part of it, uh, but are talking about building the necessary resources to govern the agency, which is being thoughtful about executive director leadership or CEO leadership. Um, evaluating and providing feedback on, on that. I mean, one of the board's biggest jobs and the only person that they really manage is the CEO, right? Or the executive director. Um, so being able to provide that CEO the, the resources they need to lead the organization, right? We also need to make sure as part of ensuring necessary resources that we're building a competent board, right? Much like Holly said, being mindful of the makeup of the board and maybe the skills and talents and connections that we might need to, to drive the mission and vision of the organization even further. The other way that we ensure resources too is being a good ambassador to the organization and our community. Um, and for TASA, it's really this statewide community. Holly, you wanna go ahead and switch to the next slide? Yes. Um, Everybody's going to find out in the ne next couple of slides. I really like lists of three. Like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is that? What is that hat? I mean, because what we're really talking about being a board member, it really is a job. I mean, we go through the process of having board job descriptions, but sometimes when we recruit, we recruit board members, we don't do a very good job of saying it is a job and these are the expectations, right? But I think if we start thinking about that, so what are the hats that we wear, right? when we're sitting at that board table. And this is just another way of, to, of thinking about how we do this strategic thinking. You know, we really think about the legal impact of, of things like uh, legal issues around um, the integrity of the organization. Are we compliant with the standards of nonprofit organizations? Um, do we have financial controls in place that we feel that we're legally getting the information we need for our fiduciary responsibility? How are we being an ambassador, right? We play that role. We really are, we expect board members, and it's a universal truth that most nonprofits want you as a board member to be a champion, right? A passionate advocate for the organization so that you can invite others to learn more and do more, right? Learn more and do more and invest, right? As a board member, we really want you to invest and volunteer, meaning learning and understanding the bylaws of the organization, maybe assessing that those bylaws need to shift to allow the agency to grow or to allow it to um, shift to do its work in a more meaningful way or to make a bigger impact, right? So we're constantly sitting um, at the board table with these three things, right? How are we going to be a champion? How are we going to invite others? And how are we going to invest, right? And they fall into kind of these three, three buckets. Holly, you want to go ahead and go to the next one? And then ultimately, on top of those hats and on top of all those things that we're talking about, we have, um, you know, and you see this in a lot of board roles and responsibilities, and it, it applies to TASA as well, that, you know, board members really have a duty of care, right? Stay informed, understand the organization, ask questions, um, understand. The more you understand the um, the organization, your bylaws, how you govern, educate yourself about different governing styles, um, you will be able to do more for the organization overall. There's also a duty of loyalty, that we're mission-minded, um, that we're not sitting at the board table as a, necessarily as a speaking as an individual and your self-interest, but you're working as a collective um, on behalf of the organization. And our duty of obedience, that we're, that we're mission-bound, that we have an open intent and some transparency about what we're doing. And very much on TASA, as the board member's major function is being the voice of members, I, I feel like that's, that's you know, if I was doing three responsibilities of TASA board members, I would almost add a fourth one and say um, duty to members as well. So those are some basic universal truths. 
Um, you know, of course, how that plays out at different organizations and different boards has a lot to do with how board members individually stay engaged between board, me board meetings, how they individually may educate themselves about nonprofit management. Um, but then we also have that duty to bring that to the board and say, hey, I think we need this educational piece. Maybe we need to bring someone in to teach us about this so that we can be more effective. Um, you know, because sometimes uh, it's not just about getting into the weeds of the organization. Boards need to stay out of that. Um, so we really need to focus on how do we do these big picture things? What can we be thinking about strategically, strategically at every, every meeting? And some of that has to do with education and some of that has to do with generating new ideas and looking at the fiduciary. But those are those three modes that you see on the screen right now. You know, we're all constantly talking about um, strategy and forward thinking um, and that fiduciary part, right? Nonprofits are nonprofits. In order to run an organization, it's just, <laughs> right? The plain truth, we need, we need money to function. Um, and sometimes, you know, you may be on a board where, you know, there's a high expectation about what that fiduciary responsibility is. But I think even more importantly, whether board members are individually fundraising or seeking resources, it's about being an ambassador to connect. Uh, if you connect to your network and influence others, right, sometimes that's more impactful um, than just, you know, looking at, you know, a budget sheet in a meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. Part of our fiduciary responsibility as board, meet, uh, board members today to look at the financial statements and ask questions and educate ourselves to make sure that we're operating in the best way possible for survivors and members, but also to make sure that the agency can fulfill its mission and vision along the way. All right, Holly, I think. Yes. Thank you so much, Christina. I really appreciate it. The, um, just wanted to pause for a moment, uh, see if anyone has any questions or clarifying or if that all kind of made sense. And we're definitely going to dig deeper more into the toss of positions in he here in a moment, but just wanted to give people a moment to just kind of touch base if anyone had any questions. Yeah, feel free to use the chat box or I can unmute if you want to raise your hand. And Christina, I really loved how you emphasized, you know, a big part of our role is to learn more and do more so that we can make a bigger impact and just further TASA's mission. So, you know, I really do feel like that that sums it up with being an, an ambassador for the agency and just being really strategic in that. I love your threes also. So I feel like, you know, usually in threes, you can you can sum things up. So I really appreciate that. So we're, we'll keep going for time's sake, but please know y'all can continue to ask questions as things come up. So I mentioned how I like puns, yes? Okay, so who who is on the board? So just so y'all know, and recapping what Christina already said, one of the specific jobs that we have is to ensure that the performance of TASA, the organization, reflects the desires of membership. Um, and how we do that is back to those things that Christina mentioned here earlier. Um, in being an ambassador, looking at those numbers, seeing how we can further TASA's mission, um, and also bringing those things to light and allowing TASA to know what membership is saying. And if they feel like they need to make um, changes according to that, then you know we entrust them with the ability to do that. Um, and you know, again, in order to best reflect our membership, we have to make sure that our board reflects that. And when we talk about at-large positions, we'll get further into that as well. But right now, we have um, 13 members that are currently on our board. And of those 13 members, some of the positions you'll see are up for, um, you know, their term is up and they can run again to be reelected on the board. But since we are a board that is dedicated to membership, we focus on allowing our membership to voice their vote on who reflects them. So it is a nomination process. It is an election process which I'll dig deep into in a moment, but our current elected members that are serving um, through 2019, I will go ahead and um, introduce them and give them a chance to say a little bit about themselves. So 
um, if we will kind of unmute each board member and give them a moment or two. So I'll start with Nicole Martinez. She is the board, our board president. Okay. Nicole? Um, there she is. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, well, happy Halloween and thank you all for joining the webinar. Um, I've been honored to be on the board since 2013 and I first started as an at-large board member. Um, what I enjoy about being on the board is playing a bigger role in the anti-sexual assault movement here in Texas and beyond. Um, I really enjoy also hearing about what our members are doing locally through all of our region representatives and appreciate everything that each of you as members do for the organization to grow. I don't know if you want me to go in more detail yeah. about what my role is as president, but I can definitely answer some more questions later on, but I want to make sure we allow time for everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and then y'all know I'm obviously our president-elect. Um, and I'm with Frisco PD as a victim advocate. I also still assist with the Turning Point Rape Crisis Center um, in their training program. And Carla is not on our call today, but she is our secretary. She is the executive director at Open Arms Rape Crisis Center and LGB, LGBT Plus Services. Um, and our treasurer, Sayama Turner, she's the founder and CEO of Fight Against Sexual Assault. And then we do have Michael Smith on the call, so I'll let him introduce himself. Sounds like I'm up, huh? <laughs> you're, you're up, it's you. <laughs> I'm Mike Smith, and uh, I've uh, been honored to serve on the board the last two years. And I, uh, you know, working uh, in law enforcement on a college campus, um, I see work that has to be done, not, uh, not only in prevention, but also working with uh, with law enforcement officers that uh, come encounters uh, with survivors often. And uh, I think that uh, serving as a conduit, uh, not only with uh, the board, uh, but also with law enforcement as well, uh, has proven to be uh, beneficial, not only uh, for others, but for myself as well. And uh, and I, I'm, I'm thankful uh, for this opportunity and uh, and I also uh, look forward to uh, possibly serving the other two years. Awesome, thank you, Mike. Um, also, just a side note, this is our executive committee. So our executive committee is always comprised of the board president, president-elect, secretary, treasurer, and then um, our board can elect a fifth person that's already a part of our board to serve as the fifth member of our executive committee. And just a side note on, on you know, kind of how that differentiates is if there's ever any big issues that come up and we can't gather a large board meeting in order to maybe address them, the executive committee has the power to come together and do that, um, which really truly doesn't happen too often because we like to always be able to include the full voice of our board. Hi, can I get a large sweet blueberry green? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Hold on. I got somebody unmuted somehow. <laughs> Whoever is having lunch or Starbucks, we really appreciate that. Well, how do we right now? Uh, for me. Oh. Okay. Oh, wait. Holly, I think I just muted you. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, Holly? I'm back. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Got overzealous. <laughs> it is all good. Um, okay, so um, our same representative, which this is another um, term that's ending, and Donna is eligible to run for another term if she chooses to, but Donna Neal is our SANE representative. So she helps represent the voice of sexual assault forensic nurses who are uh, members of TASA. And, then our Region A representative is Norma um, Lukenville, and she is the executive director at Hutchinson County Crisis Center. Norma couldn't join us on the call today, but she definitely sends um, her regards in that she's really, um, really enjoyed being a part of the TASA board and um, has been really instrumental in kind of spreading awareness about what TASA does and furthering the mission. 
And we do have Jennifer Tristan on the call, so I'll let her introduce herself. Hey, Jennifer, I just unmuted you. Our local lion tamer. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, maybe she might be having a technical difficulty. Yeah. We can come back to her. Yeah, we can come back. Jen, just type in the box if um, if you're able to make it work. If not, but Jen is Region B's representative. She just recently, a month or so ago, helped host our special meeting as well as um, the Region B meeting where we approved the legislative agenda for this coming year. So that was really exciting. And Jen did a great job of um, hosting that. And she is also the chair of our resolutions committee. Uh, yeah. I think Jen is having a microphone uh, issue. <laughs> She was talking to her screen. Oh, <laughs> no worries, Jed. I'm glad you're on our call. Holly, could you describe just for everybody like Region B is kind of the Interstate 35 corridor of Central Texas, so to speak. So everybody can kind of get an idea. If you're not if you're on the call and you're not familiar with our regions, um, it might be helpful just to kind of understand. Um, so and Region A, I don't know how, how would you describe that. That's like um west texas <laughs> yes like the um kind of panhandle-ish area is that accurate mike you're part of region a i'm so bad at geography i have to pull up the map thanks nicole looks like uh, nicole actually posted the link oops so i'm going to just pull it up really quick so y'all can see too so here's region a um and so you can see all of the counties that are a part of that region b C is where we are, which, you know, we're kind of giant, but we've got Collin County, Dallas County, Tarrant County, Fannin, um, all of those um, areas. Then we've got Region um, D, which um, you can see all of the counties that that entails, and that's right here. Uh, region E, and then Region F. And that's posted in the box in case um, y'all want to take a look at that later, um, or in case you weren't sure which region you're in, that map really helps um, simplify that. Thank you so much for uh, providing that, Nicole. So um, Selma, I believe, is on the call. We didn't have a chance to test her mic, but uh, Selma, do you want to introduce yourself? So I've unmuted you, Selma, but it looks like you're self-muted. Okay. So if that, you have that's to okay. Mm -hmm. well, we'll just keep going and then Selma if you're able to just chat in the box and we'll give you a chance but she is our Region C representative and director at Kaleidoscope Paths and then Region D representative um, Q Olivia she's the deputy director at Bridge Over Troubled Waters I'll give her a second to uh, tell us a little bit about herself Good morning, everyone. Olivia Rivers Hi. here at the bridge. Um, we are in Pasadena, which is like 15 minutes away from downtown Houston. So that's kind of my area of coverage, the greater Houston area and beyond. Um, excited to be on the board. It's my first year and it's been an honor and a privilege to serve with these amazing individuals and looking forward to um, more years to come, hopefully. Thanks so much, Q, Olivia. We love having you. Um, I'll just shout out, she presented at a conference here in Regency a couple weeks ago and was amazing. So just wanted to add that shout out to you. Um, re, and so did Christina, actually. Lots of great feedback. Saw both of y'all's evals and they were both amazing. Sorry. Oh, um, nice. I think so, Selma uh, may be oh, able to talk yeah, now. Selma. Oh, no, it changed again. Oh, wait one more second. Now. Yeah, we hear Can you. Can you hear Selma? me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, technology works great when it works. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I have been on it for several times, and I uh, wouldn't trade uh, everything I've learned and the people I've met for anything. Uh, it's a good experience. Region C covers 78 counties. And uh, because I used to be on a crisis center, I worked at a crisis center, and then I have my own counseling and so forth, I get to go in and meet a lot of people and help law enforcement and uh, different ones and get them involved in our TASA membership. And this is so important um, as a board member being very involved, and um, I highly recommend it. 
uh, for anyone that is interested and that is willing to um, stand up and speak out. Love that, Selma. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Selma. And then our Region E representative, Bonnie, she had another conflict and could not be on the call, but she's the Director for Strategic Development at uh, Cassidy Center Against Sexual, uh, uh, Sexual Assault and Family Violence. And then our Region F representative, which is one of the other positions that will be open um, for this go around of nominations, is Gloria, and she is on the call. Gloria, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone, um, and happy Halloween. My name is Gloria, and I am the Executive Director for Friendship of Women in Brownsville, which is the lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, I've been on the board for two terms, which would be four years, and it's been an amazing experience. Um, I've had an opportunity to learn a lot about not just what's going on statewide, but also um, from our region. And I highly encourage anyone from our region um, to run for board, for board membership, because I guarantee you that you're gonna love it. Um, it's a great group of people very passionate about their work, full of energy. And if that's the kind of person you want, then this is definitely the board to join. Thank you. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks so much, Gloria. And um, Gloria, since we already kind of have you on the line, would you mind just speaking a little bit about some of the things um, you feel like y'all have done in Region F since you've been on the board? Um, so, during my board um, time, it's been a little challenging to get all um, regions involved, or not regions, but to get all members involved in our region. So what I've tried to do is visit with like the local communities in our area and um, have calls with them. And so as many of you may know, um, our biggest challenge here in the border is the border. And you know, with our clients, some of them having um, to deal with immigration issues and um, not wanting to come forward um, to talk about their violence because of the fear of deportation um, has been one of the highest um, areas that I know that I've talked to in our community. Thanks so much for sharing that, Gloria. And I think that's a great example of just how sharing, you know, with our board and sharing with the community of what's going on and what challenges y'all are facing in your region is a huge part of what we you know do on the board so that we can um, help as a movement be strategic on how to um, you know how to address that how do we advocate more you know for those survivors and, and especially when we may not be in a region who um, is seeing that necessarily to that ex extent and be able to support each other in the work and so really appreciate all you do Gloria thanks so much for for sharing that. Um, and then our last at large position I wanted to share is Kara Breeden. Um, she's got her super long and multiple hat role, just like a lot of us do um, on there, but she is a forensic nurse as well and um, is a CEO of her um, own initiative as well as um, for the Harris County um, forensic nurse examiners and a clinical professor. Um, so. That is our board, our current board, everyone serving right now. So as y'all saw, these are the open positions. So we have one at-large position open that's open to any background. So as long as you know you meet the minimum requirements, it doesn't matter necessarily what discipline you come from, but like we mentioned earlier, a big part of what we are looking for is to make sure that members, are, our board members represent our um, our, our member membership, whole membership base. Then we will um, actually have an additional at-large position available, and that it is one that we are specifically targeting and requesting that applicants for that position are ones who have a mental health or counseling background. Specifically, you know, we're um, preferring licensed professionals, and a big reason behind that is that was actually a gap we identified on our board um, based on what our membership as a whole is. And I'll have actually a breakdown of that here in a moment. 
The same representative position is open and Region F. So let's just kind of look at some of the basics on eligibility. These are also available all online and I'll pull up the uh, document here towards the end so y'all can just see where everything is found. But just some basics on eligibility. Our SANE representative in our at-large positions, this is actually something that is a little bit of a change this year. So previously, if for at-large positions, there was not a mi minimum membership um, time. And based on what we have heard from membership and you know, just talking with our committees, we realized, well, you know, if we really want to maximize, my, maximize the voices of membership, it's important that you've been a member at least for a year in order to be able to know what TAS has been doing, to be involved in that um, movement, in that in our voting processes, in our um, in our mission. And so that is a eligibility requirement we added to those roles this year. So um, just on the basic level, you have to have at least been an individual TASA member or an author authorized delegate of an organizational member for a minimum of one year. Um, organizational supporters, which have, this is not new, uh, organizational supporters have not ever been eligible for uh, board positions. And a supporter, just so you all know, is someone that's not necessarily providing direct services or education or prevention or, you know, but they are maybe a supporter of the movement as a, as a whole. Um, so they don't have those voting privileges, but they still get some of the other benefits of TASA. Um, Region F, um, this requirement hasn't changed at all. Um, to run for the Region F position, you have to be a current TASA individual member or authorized delegate uh, for a minimum of two years and obviously a member of Region F because that role is really focused on helping support that region, that area um, in particular. Um, other requirements that are part of um, being eligible as you're considering whether or not to run is the availability to attend the TASA conference. That's not a, um, you know, it's not a non-negotiable in a sense, but um, like Christina was mentioning earlier, we consider being on the board as a job. We don't get paid for the job, but <laughs> it is a job and we, um, we are passionate about what we do. And so really, really, you, you know, we have the expectation that when you are running for the board, that you're saying, I am willing to attend every board meeting. I'm willing to complete all of the requirements um, and, and not just minimum, but really strive to move beyond that because that's a part of us moving the overall um, uh, movement of ending sexual violence um, and, and kind of making it a bigger impact. So um, there are travel funds and we'll talk about that in a second, but it's, it's making that time and making that commitment to attend those meetings. And we provide all of those dates um, at our annual meeting. So at the um, TASA annual board meeting, which is at the conference, we set the dates for the remainder of the year. So that way you can plan ahead to make sure, you know, you're not scheduling anything and it gives plenty of time for people to do that. And I can tell you, I've met lots of board members and I myself, you know, it's, we all work for nonprofits, we all have full-time jobs, um, or we work for agencies that, you know, we're, we're all, we've got busy, busy schedules. And, you know, I know a lot of board members and, and, and consistently our board does have a really good attendance rate. So we want to continue that. The other piece of that is to serve on a committee, which I'll talk about those committees in a second, and then having no conflict of interest. So um, sometimes people ask, you know, what's what would that be? What would that look like? So, um, you know, it's avoiding any type of conflict that would cause you to maybe self promote in a way or gain um, uh, you know, gain in a personal way um, by being a board member for, you know, for instance, you know, you always, I think of insider trading whenever I think of conflict of interest, right? So if you're using being a board member to maybe further a personal business that you have and, or maybe um, get people to buy into your services, um, there may be times where the agency, Tasa, you know, decides to, um, you know, 
uh, choose to work with a certain agency that the board may be a part of, but that wouldn't be because as being a board, you had exclusive information to anything, if that makes sense, hopefully. Um, and you know, another conflict of interest would be if you were trying to gain employment um, at TASA for yourself or any other family member, um, or if you maybe work for an organization that's a big funder of TASA or a don't, you know, or you may be related to a bigger donor of, of TASA. So, you know, I mean, the Office of the Attorney General is kind of a good example of that. So um, you most likely, I mean, even if you were to talk to your employer, they would tell you, well, that's a conflict of interest for you to be on that board since, um, you know, they provide a large amount of funding for the work that TASA actually does. Um, and if y'all have more questions about that, please feel free to chat into the um, box or you can always reach out to us later. So what are some of the committees? So the committees that, um, as the positions that are um, on our, our slate are eligible to sit on are our policy governance committee. So really as being a board member, every board member serves on that committee. Our policy governance has to do with what Christina was talking about. How do we govern ourselves on the board? Um, and you know, we actually have several, several pages um, of policies that help direct how we're able to do things. They help us decide what are the ends of the organization. So where, you know, where does TASA want to go? What is the focus? Um, it helps us know what our limitations are. So one of our main jobs as a board member is to um, monitor the CEO or the executive director. But we still don't tell her what to do. What we have our policies help guide us on is telling her what she can't do. So basically, we set some limitations, um, and then she works with those limitations. So, so we don't say you can do this or you can't do this, but we just kind of give her limitations, like you know, don't spend money irresponsibly, or um, you know, don't make a decision that you know may put us in a bad. Um, financial um, status or cause um, issues with funders or things like that. You know, we kind of set some of those limitations. Um, we also set monitoring tools on how we monitor ourselves and how we monitor the executive director or the CEO. So how we monitor the progress of what, you know, the um, CEO is doing and how we as a board are performing is part of our policy governance. And so that's something that we always keep an eye on. And like Christina says, if, if something in that policy governance is causing problems and not helping the agency move further, then as the committee for policy governance, we may look at that and see how um, we can make changes or modify those as needed. Um, so that's a whole board thing. And, you know, trust me, when I first joined the board, and I know other board members can echo this, when I learned about policy governance, I think I, you know, felt like I was hearing a different language of some sort, and I just it felt very confused and overwhelmed. But I will. <laughs> I like will, reading stereo instructions for the first time. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And or like putting together something from IKEA. Like it just felt like I don't know what I'm doing. But I will say that's where board members who have served longer than you come in and can help and reading them. You know, it's it's really amazing how just reading things over and over and learning more, like Christina said, and, and taking that initiative on yourself and reaching out to other people who do know more about policy governance um, will help you. And the other cool thing is when you are elected onto the board, your very first board meeting, we do have a policy governance training to help at least um, set the stage so you're not you know, totally um, feeling overwhelmed. Uh, but some of you may come in with experience already in that area, and if so, then that's definitely welcome. Bylaws are the other thing. So all members have access to all these things. So bylaws help also govern us as well. And again, they, they kind of set the stage on um, who can be nominated, who's eligible to run, um, what we do as the board, what type of benefits you get, um, our mission statement. There's so many things that are part of those bylaws, but they're, they're, they're legal 
document and our membership um, has to vote on any changes of bylaws. Um, but as the board, you know, it is also our responsibility to always review those bylaws and make sure they're in line with what our membership is expressing with what the movement is about. And so, you know, that is an area where we have a committee focusing on so that we can make sure they're also clear and make sense. You know, so if we're constantly hearing members who are reading the bylaws and educating themselves saying, I still don't understand this, or this is really limiting, um, then that's where we take that voice back to our committee and hopefully uh, address those changes. Our nominations committee, so if you are a region representative, so region F, for example, if you are elected or running for um, region F, then you would automatically be on the nominations committee. And within our um, policy governance, it also states that our president elect is kind of the designated chair for that committee. And that's part of what we're doing now. Our job as the nominations committee is to look at who's our membership, who's on our board, are we reflecting our membership, how are we making sure that you know the voices of the movement are heard, that we're elevating voices that are um, being marginalized, that we are you know really taking part of um, furthering the movement. So you know every every year, so odd years and even years, there are typically positions that you know there's terms that are ending. So this year, these are the terms that are ending, and so our nominations committee gets together. We make sure our application still works. We decide who we're going to focus recruitment on. Um, we hold calls like this. This is kind of one of our first. Um, but we try to really spread the word so we can get um, you know, more board involvement from our current membership base. Then our resolutions committee, which I mentioned earlier, Jen Tristan is the chair of. This is an amazing committee. It really helps us make a huge impact. And Chris Kaiser um, at TASA has often said when they are fighting for change, they often use resolutions that have been drafted by the board and membership to say, well, all of our TASA members have said that this is a priority. This is a stance that TASA members have on um, a certain issue, you know, whether that be continuing funding for rape crisis centers or making sure that we're protecting the right to receive sexual assault exams or, or not reporting things that impact the survivors that we are seeing day in and day out um, and impacting the movement as a whole. Resolutions can help change that and set the direction for TASA to continue focusing on. This last year, we had a couple resolutions that focused on trauma-informed agencies and making sure that as um, centers that are working with survivors, we're also keeping the culture of our agency um, trauma-informed because we know that can trickle down into services. So those are the kind of things we, um, the resolutions committee focuses on. And you as a member, whether you're on the board or not, ha all, always have the ability to propose resolutions. And then we have the finance committee. I don't like numbers at all. I have really worked hard on that, and that's been my area of growth because at, since I've joined the board is to really teach myself more about finances and what questions to ask and what to look for um, because, again, that's part of my job. It, um, but we do have a finance committee. Part of their job is to do salary review for the CEO to really make sure when we have audits, things like that, that they're aware and that they're keeping our board um, aware of the things that we need to be doing and the agency, um, you know, where it needs to be at as far as any financial liabilities or things like that. So the treasurer is um, automatically a member of that committee. So those are just, you know, the basics. We do have, sometimes have ad hoc committees pop up if we have specific things that we need to focus on. Um, but part of your job, if you are on the board, is to um, you know, do the work of the committee. And that does mean not just at the board meeting, but in between board meetings, making sure to connect with other committee members, whether it's over the phone or through email, and really, um, you know, taking the time to um, dig deep into what your role is on that committee. And to make it easy, we typically have one board meeting in which um, each of these committees kind of have a key role. So, um, resolutions is one that's kind of that's that's coming up and nominations obviously because that's where we are at 
right now. And so it's not necessarily you have a ton of things to do at every board meeting, but there are specific board meetings that you do need to make sure to be prepared for. Um, and like I said, we will make sure you know the expectations um, what, and you get to sign up for the committee. So you can ask as many questions as you want to about those committees um, during your first board meeting. Um, and uh, we'll help you make that decision and, uh, or help inform your decision if you need help on which committee you feel like you fit best with. And I think, uh, oh, and this is Christina, um, one of yeah. the great things that Holly is talking about the different committees and work, one of the things that I really enjoyed as a, as a TASA board member is that the governing, the governing style, the policy governance, you know, we actually not only know the dates of when our meetings are gonna be, but we also know our focus areas because there's some set agenda. I mean, agendas yeah. can always be modified, but you know, one of the things that I see in the work that I do with boards from across the state, sometimes, you know, there's no time to plan agendas. Sometimes time gets away, people having board meetings every month. I think the thing that's really nice about how this board operates um, and its uniqueness and its policy governance style is there are some set agenda items that happen strategically at meetings. So every board member knows um, what to be prepared for um, and, and can really take that time in between meetings to really be strategically thinking about what needs to happen at that next meeting because there's no surprises necessarily on the agenda. Um, you know, there are always gonna be things that come up, but I think you know, if you're sitting here and you're saying, oh man, this seems like a lot of work, it absolutely is, but I think that the very cool and unique thing about um, TASA's governance style is this idea that, that everyone can be prepared in a very specific way, and we're not shifting um, at the last minute all the time, right? We're not, we're trying to stay out of that reactionary mode. And, you know, and if, and if you've been on previous boards, my guess is that that may not have been your experience in the past. Um, so it's a very different way of operating, but it also makes all of these responsibilities a little bit easier to kind of address as you go along throughout the year. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Yes, Christina, thank you. That is huge. I mean, it really does make a huge, you know, as someone who had served on a different type of board where, you know, maybe it was two weeks or three weeks notice, like we need you to work on this as a committee. Um, it really, it really is set apart from that because you will know when, you know, with you have a yearly agenda and you'll know when your main role uh, comes up and, and when to really be focusing on that. Thank you so much for highlighting that. So what is an at-large member? So I mentioned earlier that they represent our TASA membership at large. So I wanted to just kind of give y'all a little um, snapshot on who our members are and you know what kind of went into our decision especially for that focused mental health um, or counseling at large person so as you'll see uh, executive directors are a big chunk of our members and sometimes that's because you know they're the ones that you know are, are um, maybe writing the checks or they're the ones that are going to the ED conference or the first ones that really know about it and doesn't always trickle down, but we are definitely, that's something I know we've been trying to create more awareness on why individual membership is also so important so that you also are represented in this um, lovely pie. So executive directors are a big piece of that and our board does have, as you saw earlier, um, a good amount of executive directors represented. So um, that's not really an area we have a gap in. Um, SANE is, um, or forensic nurses are another kind of chunk, which is why into our bylaws it is uh, represented that we should always have a SANE representative. Um, and then that next bigger chunk is that counseling um, piece. We have a lot of counselors that are members of TASA, but we um, lost one um, of our counselor, um, one counselor who ended her term last go around. Um, and then, um, you know, especially with our, our changing board structure, that's the area we want to make sure we're having a licensed professional represented on the board or counselor. So that way those issues can be representative, that voice can be represented on our, on our board. And then aside from that, we've got advocates, we've got police departments, we've got youth prevention, 
we've got you know military these kind of like smaller um, sections over here are just military attorneys or prosecutors universities um, title nine individuals are are a smaller piece of that pie but they're still represented so as you think about whether or not to run for an at-large position, just wanted everyone to have a view of who members are um, and the voices we wanna try to really reach and connect with um, at this point um, around. So other things, and I mentioned earlier, so uh, mental health counseling, we wanna fill that gap. At-large, we're really any background. Um, same representative, some of the voices that we have heard through member feedback is um, that, you know, sayings don't always heal, feel heard, um, and the kind of uh, continuing education opportunities or just really um, being able to feel like they have a voice in the movement and some of the issues that they're seeing. And so if you are a nurse that, that really can connect with that or maybe has some of those connections currently and um, are interested in running that for that role, that's definitely a need. Um, Region F representative, one of the things to consider is there is an expectation to hold region meetings once a quarter. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, and Gloria said, because our regions are so spread out, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to um, hold them always in person. You can do, you know, a web-based meeting. You can visit some agencies and have smaller meetings. There's you know, a lot of support that we can provide uh, region reps and we brainstorm on how to how to do that. But it is an expectation that there should be one a quarter um, and that you're there to support members. You heard Gloria talk about how she, you know, would call and connect with other people in Region F just to see how they're doing, see what, you know, um, what they're seeing so that we can continue to share the voice of Region F at our board meetings. Um, and that's a big piece of that, providing that feedback as well. And to, to stay connected to an earlier thought that we had about strategic thinking and how nonprofits shift and change over time, a good example of that is with regional representation on the board. Yes. You know, CASA is based in Austin and you know the staff, you know, started small but mighty and then grew. And now, you know, we're at a stage of growth where we have regional staff. You know, I'm a good example of that. I live and um, work out of Region C, I, you know, and I'm in a position that I travel the whole state, like many TASA staff do, um, but also um, support my region in any way possible. And that includes, you know, supporting Selma, you know, as the region rep for Region C on the board. Um, she can turn to me, Holly can turn to me, and I can help as a TASA staff member. And that's something that we didn't used to have in the past. And, so we have regional staff now that also um, can provide even a greater um, voice of members to those board members and help facilitate those meetings because we also recognize that our board members, uh, you know, have full-time jobs and need to do other things. So that's just a great example of how you know um, you can utilize staff as a resource for the if you were in a regional position, um, and it also just kind of reflects how agencies change and you know, and, and how board members might look at that in the future. Okay, the agency now has regional reps, um, you know, are we duplicating work, right? Those are those kind of strategic questions that um, that um, board members think about, right? I just wanted to use that as an example. <laughs> Love that, no, that's a great example. And, you know, especially, um, you know, I think you, do you wanna mention just since you did, I think that's great to know what other regional staff there are too, because that is a huge piece of not only your support as a region rep, but I mean, I know that came out of hearing more feedback from membership and what areas needed more people like boots on the ground um, support. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think, you know, TASA heard um, loud and clear, um, board members heard loud and clear um, that members sometimes felt disconnected. Um, you know, because that happens, right? We we often have to interact with a lot of different agencies that are all based in Austin, you know, um, and sometimes it, it happens over time. We might be out of touch a little bit with what's going on in the unique um, spaces of Texas. Texas is big, it's diverse, it's, um, it's constant, constantly changing and the issues um, that we're working on um, really have to be responsive to what's happening within our state. Um, 
And so, you know, TASA over time developed this idea around regional staff. And currently we have uh, myself and Region C. Um, we have um, Rick Kipridge, who many of you um, have, may know over time at TASA. Um, he, he has many uh, titles, but he's also strategically in San Antonio, um, which is in Region B, but he also is a support system to really Region B and, and, and South Texas, really all the way to the border. Um, and then we just, uh, we have Shelly Collins, who is in the Houston area and, and can provide, you know, more strategic support and connection um, in that part of Texas. And then um, we just um, added Virginia um, to our team, and she is in um, El Paso and can now really connect to that community in a, diff in a different way, and, and, and she's part of our remote team. So um, as a member of the remote team, we love that. We love to be able to connect um, more meaningfully in our community and bring that feedback also back to the TASA office. So. Thanks so much. I appreciate you sharing that. That's and that's been such a huge help. I know even for me as a as a member of TASA. So um, just some other pieces I wanted um, to just bring to everyone's attention and a lot of questions. Y'all asked some great questions as you were signing up for the webinar, and a lot of the questions asked can really be covered in these documents, um, which I'm going to open the online nomination application. Hopefully, everyone's still here, right? I didn't lose anybody. <laughs> okay, okay, that scared me for some reason. Um, so, um, when you go to this application, you will be able to see the open positions. You'll also be able to click and actually see, and I already I think I have this one open, the descriptions of all of the positions, and they're written very much like a job description, um, and it lets you know your term. So, all of the positions you know that are open have a two-year Term. So you would serve two years in your position. It lets you know um, kind of the time commitment, general responsibilities, so you can review all of that for each uh, individual position. The other piece that as you're going through the application, you'll see um, we want to make sure everyone's fully aware of what you're committing to because when you fill out the application, if you are elected, you know you will would have to be committing to all of these things. So. Um, the travel policy, which uh, for some reason is not working. Maybe I have to click that. Oh, there we go. At least it redirected me. Um, so the travel policy is listed. So we do re have a budget that we stick to. So anyone who's worked budgets before, um, you know, knows that we stick, you know, that's part of our fiscal responsibility. We stick to that budget. But there are things like travel that are reimbursable and there's certain expenses that are reimbursable. For instance, when I travel from um, out in the middle of nowhere, Frisco-ish, but it's not really Frisco, even though they let me put that on my mail, I'm not incorporated because I guess I'm just not cool enough to be in Frisco. But um, when I travel from there to Austin for a board meeting, um, I can submit for either mileage reimbursement or uh, because the city is so wonderful and lets me use my city vehicle, but they don't let me um, have free gas, I can submit my gas receipts for reimbursement. Um, we also cover hotel as part of that, but we ask that board members just be responsible. And if you don't need a hotel, you know, then you don't have to take advantage of that. You know, we ask in advance for people to let us know who needs the hotel and who doesn't. So TASA can arrange all of that with the wonderful discounts and things that they work out um, on their, their end so we can be responsible. So we're not asking you to have to pay all of this out of pocket. Um, so if for those four meetings that you may have to travel for, there are some reimbursable expenses. So be sure to review that travel policy and let us know if you have questions. The other piece to look at is this wonderful document on just how the TASA board does business. It recaps a lot of what we talked about here today, but it's a really great overview of just some of the things that um, we do and things that we don't do as well, just in case, even though this is a recorded webinar and I'm sure you can go back and, and listen to it, it also is a great one sheet to help with that. Um, the, and I think that's really the, the main 
pieces of that um, and the bylaws, which I know Nicole sent in the chat box, if you log into your member portal, those are available um, online as well in case you want to review those bylaws. Um, and those are just all really important things to look at and at least try to get somewhat of an awareness of as you're considering running for the board. You don't by any means have to you know, fully understand everything about the bylaws but have a general understanding of how TASA does business and what being on the board means. And absolutely make sure you fully understand the position descriptions um, and expectations of your role. Um, and as a, as a board, we're here for you and we hope you reach out um, if you have questions or you're considering running so that when you submit that application, you feel confident in knowing um, your expectations. And just in a date, the deadline is December 1st for submitting your nomination application. Some of the other questions we had is how much travel is involved. So we kind of covered that. Um, the descriptions actually say three face-to-face -face and one teleconference. Due to the kind of change of the conference schedule, that's shifting more towards four face-to-face -face meetings a year, one of which, again, is at the conference. And prompt and full attendance at regular and special meetings are accept, expected of all board members. And if you do not attend 50% um, of those face-to-face -face meetings, there is kind of, it, there is an automatic resignation that occurs. Um, so it really is an expectation that you attend all of them. Are board members paid? No, we're not. We're paid in satisfaction with the work that we're doing <laughs> and supporting um, TASA. So most of us all have our well, I mean, not most of us, all of us have full-time jobs. Some of them, some agencies I know have flexible funding where they allow um, their employees to do some board work while they're on the clock for their individual agency. But depending on if you're funded by grants or how you're funded, that may not always be the case. I know I have to do a lot of my board work kind of after hours when I'm off the pocket at Frisco and so that's just something to be aware of and maybe talk with your supervisor about to see if that's an option for you because that can sometimes make some of the um, roles a little more feasible and then we talked a little bit about this too what are some conflicts of interest so employment from an agency or organization that provides grant funds using a position to gain employment or access to inside information or personal gain we do also have a um, a, a, a policy that states that if there is currently a board member that works for an agency that you also work or volunteer for, then you cannot run for the board, you're not eligible, and that's to kind of avoid some of those conflict of interest, but also make sure we're, we're keeping some representation of different agencies on the board as well. So those are the big um, piece of, um, the questions that we had asked and some the stuff we wanted to cover. Now we still have about 15 minutes left. Wanted to just open it up to any questions, either from myself or our other board members that we have. Um, I'm just gonna kind of open it up, see what we can answer for y'all. All right, everybody. I'm gonna um, try just for a second um, to unmute everyone. I know sometimes that's uh, easier just to answer, uh, ask a quick question. Um, if it's a little too unruly, I'll, I'll mute again, but just in case, or maybe. There we go. So everybody's currently unmuted. If you, if you wanna ask a question before we get off the call or use the chat box, now's a great time to do that. You have Holly's information there. Um, uh, again, I will also, after the end of the webinar, be emailing everybody um, links to the resources um, that Holly mentioned and highlighted. Um, you probably already have them, uh, but just in case, um, I will make sure that they come in uh, a follow-up email. And I'll also ask you to just um, give us a little bit of feedback about the webinar with a quick evaluation. Um, so that can help the board prepare for the next time that they do this and, um, and, and let us know maybe um, areas of opportunity. Well, 
I think everybody's thinking about Halloween candy. I know, or else you've already eaten a bunch and you've got the <laughs> sugar rush happening. Uh, well, if y'all don't have any questions, I just wanted to thank everyone for being on the call. One thing I did forget to mention is you can actually nominate someone as well. So on that same board application, there is a spot in the nomination application is live. Um, it, it was on the webinar link that went out. You should, um, and then there was a member email that went out to all members as well with the link, but I'll make sure we send it out again. Um, but if you go to that application, you'll see there's an, a place where you can click to actually nominate someone if you yourself don't want to run, but you know someone who would be a great fit. And so there's a separate form and a place where it allows you to uh, do that. So I will. Oh, sorry, Holly. <laughs> oh, you're okay. <laughs> Trying to answer your question. I muted you again. Um, yes, yeah, somebody asked if the slides will be available. They absolutely will be. I'll be sending that out in that follow-up email. So be on the lookout for that. Um, let's see. Um, did you? Uh, somebody asked, is the board nomination link live? Yes. It is, yes. And we can share it in the chat box. Yes, um, I can do that. Great. Let's do that real quick. And I'll make sure we... Um, if you're not a member on Facebook yet, there is a member group too. So just um, in case, that's a great way to uh, uh, get some of that info too, because we tend to post on there. Well, all right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we'll we'll be connecting to you again. Um, oh, Holly just shared in the chat box um, the link to the nomination form. Um, I'll also make sure it's included in the follow-up um, email. Yeah. This Have was a great. Following. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.